Welcome, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I am so glad that you are here with us, joining us for the conclusion of our Christmas weekend gatherings and the conclusion of our teaching series called Waiting. Over the last couple of weeks, we have been endeavoring to help all of us learn how we can wait well and how we can find more worth during our waiting periods. And so if you missed any one of those messages, feel free to get on AuthenticChurch.com or download our app where you can get all of our messages on the sermons page there. Now, if you're a parent here, you're accustomed to waiting on your kids to do a lot of things. Can I get some amens from the parents out there? I heard one person say, mm-hmm, but I wonder if I could get a couple more amens from the parents out there. To clean their rooms or to take out the garbage or to stop hitting their siblings or to go to sleep. We wait on our kids sometimes to go bathe when we ask them to, to eat the things we want them to. Or it seems like we're always waiting on our kids to pick up after themselves, to tie their shoelaces, to answer yes ma'am or yes sir, to do things that are polite to other adults around them. We're waiting on our kids all the time. My wife and I are parents to teenage daughters, and that is very interesting in and of itself. Because it seems like we're always waiting on them to wake up on time to go to school. We're waiting on them to clean their bathroom, waiting for them to make up their bed, or just to be just nice adults at times, or young adults at times. And it seems like every week I'm like Jesus standing outside of their room, like when he stood outside of the tomb of his friend Lazarus, who was dead, and asked him to come forth. I feel like every Sunday I'm calling for a resurrection of my daughters out of their rooms to get to church on time. And as we know, Christmas is coming up. I've gotten my kids several gifts. We're really excited about what we got them. And I thought, well, I need to get them some cards to go with it. And um, I'm pretty sarcastic in my own sense of humor. Helps me deal with the pain of the world. And so um, I thought I'd get you guys to help me pick out a card for my daughters, you know, my teenage daughters. So uh, card number one is this. I thought about getting her this one. You're making it difficult for me to be the parent I always imagined I'd be. What do you think about that one? Maybe this one will work. Gosh, these preteen years are all sunshine and rainbows, said no parent ever. But, but I figure I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian, and I want to make sure that I keep my kids rooted in the gospel. So I want to get them a biblical card. I think this one might work. How about this? The reason G- raising teenagers, the reason Jesus turned water into wine. I think, is that the one that wins? <laughs> As a father, I'm constantly waiting on my kids to do the things that I would love for them to do. It's, it's a, something just poked me here a second ago. I was like, that was weird. As a father, I'm constantly waiting for things that I want my kids to do, and at times they just don't comply. And the passage that we're about to read was written 2,700 years ago. It has so many implications for us today, though, because Isaiah is the prophet that we'll read from today. He prophesied to a group of people that were struggling with what it looked like to live out their faith under the oppression of their enemies. And these people were the Jewish people. And they were praying for a Messiah to come for a long period of time so that they could get freedom from their oppression and to feel joy and peace and all the things that you and I want to feel today as well. But in the passage that we're about to read, most biblical scholars say that it is the center of Isaiah's prophecy to God's people. And in fact, it's a central theme to the entire Bible in and of itself. So about 700 years before the Christ child was born, we learn about the Jewish people being in captivity. There's a superpower during that time, a nation called Assyria. Anybody who steps in their way gets destroyed. They have a king by the name of Sennacherib, and Sennacherib is notorious for smothering any other competition around him. And it just so happens that the next nation that he's about to conquer is the Jewish people. And so they're really afraid. They're so nervous. They're so scared because they know that they don't have a military response to this nation with so much resources and with such a notorious history. And so they do what we often do. They resort to their own means of saving themselves. They try their best to put everything into their own hands. And so God starts speaking to his people like they're his children. And he says some words like this. What sorrow awaits my rebellious children, says the Lord. You make plans that are contrary to mine. 
you make alliances not directed by the Spirit, thus, or my Spirit, thus piling up your sins. For without consulting me, you have gone down to Egypt for help. You have put your trust in Pharaoh's protection, Pharaoh the leader of Egypt. You have tried to hide in his shade. Now, having teenage daughters sometimes is very strange because they'll come and tell you what they're going to do instead of asking you what they're going to do. So they'll say, hey, Dad, I'm going to the mall with some of my friends. Never ask me. So I say, okay, well, how are you getting there? They're like, you? Who do you think I'm getting there? So, so what are you going to buy because you have no money? I'm like, Dad, you're going to give me money. And so... Most of the time I have to let them know I'm not giving you any money and I'm not taking you to the mall. And usually when I say that to my daughter Haley, she'll say, it's okay, Lucilla's mom will take us. So I feel like God in this passage. I think I'm going to start quoting these verses. I'm going to say, what sorrow awaits you, my rebellious child? <laughs> you make plans that are contrary to mine. You make alliances with Lucila's mom, not directed by my spirit. <laughs> Thus piling up your sins. <laughs> but the truth is, we're just like the children of Israel, and we're just like my daughter. When we ask our father for something, we just expect that he's going to answer right away. And if he doesn't, we've already made alternate plans to get where we want to go. A lot of times my daughter knows that if I say no, she's already going to come up with an alternative to get where she wants to go. And so many of us do the same thing. These Israelites never thought of themselves as rebellious children, but they were. And second, they were so baffled that God didn't answer their prayers right away because they were so afraid that they were going to get plowed over. But they weren't obedient people. And so they gathered up all of their resources. They did everything that they could to save themselves from the imminent threat that was coming coming by going back to Egypt. Egypt, the place that God had delivered them from some years before where they were oppressed and enslaved and treated harshly, they went back to the same place that God delivered them from, the same place that robbed them of joy, the same place that robbed them of a healthy lifestyle. And isn't it like you and I, that sometimes instead of seeking our Father and being still until He answers we just go back to our proverbial Egypts, which could be us waiting for people to affirm us again and living our lives just solely thinking that I need people to affirm me or to give me likes on social media or to rest on our education. We go back to these proverbial Egypts that make us feel more comfortable, that does not have the power to deliver us. And God says, by trusting Pharaoh, you will be humiliated. And by depending on him, you will be disgraced. For though his power extends to Zoan and his officials have arrived in Hanes, all who trust in him will be ashamed. He will not help you. Instead, he will disgrace you. In other words, when we move outside of God's power for our lives, we usually resort to things that make us powerless. And God is a good father trying to lead us in the direction that we should go. Assyria is too strong for them, and they cannot be defended against them in their own ability, but there's resorting to something else. How many times have you and I, in our impatience, turned to things that we hope would soothe us, but it can't save us? How many times have we been so impatient that we resort to something that leaves us with the biggest thing that our culture is struggling with as a whole? The word shame. We do things that are disgraceful and things that are harsh and things that we think are going to save us, and we end up in shame. And that's why God continues to woo his children. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. In quietness and confidence is your strength, but you would have none of it. He's talking to his children saying, look, the only way that you're going to make it is if you return or if you repent in some translations, which means to say sorry, to turn away from our own way of living and then rest in me. And I want to take a different angle on the Christmas story this year to let you know that God's trying to communicate something to us. And if there's one big idea I want to get across and prove throughout the text that we're about to read is that God is waiting for us to see that Jesus takes our sins from us. He's waiting for us, that God is actually waiting right now for you and I to see something powerful, that Jesus takes our sins from us. And the first thing that we know we need to know to integrate this message into our lives is that all of us need to return to God. 
We need to repent. We need to turn away from our sins and turn to God. Christmas reminds us that God waits to see us receive his glory, that this time is about us admitting that we're lost without him, that we have no defense, that we have no power, and while we wait for his second coming, that we need to turn with repentance in his direction. Here's what we miss every single Christmas that we don't highlight enough, that God sent his son in the world to save us from our sins. That's the beauty and the glory of Christmas. Remember, the angel prophesies and tells Mary that she would bear a son and that his name would be called Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. All these years, the Jewish people were paying for a Messiah or praying for a Messiah to reduce and to take out the pain in their lives and to get the government or the oppressors that were over them out of their lives. But they were not praying for a savior from their sins. And during this season, we can expect things from God, but we don't expect to look internally and see that God is trying to let us know that if we were not sinners, you and I, he would never have to send his son to save us from our sins. That's the beauty of Christmas. And sometimes God has to put us in time out for us to realize the beauty of Christmas. You know, Some of us put our kids in timeout. They start acting up. They're crying. They're embarrassing you in Target. Like, where are you from? Like, where is this little kid? Why is he embarrassing me in Target? And you say, you're going to go in timeout. Like, those the kids today are so privileged. There was no timeout when I was growing up in my Jamaican family. Like, never. The the, the only timeouts was when my dad took timeout to breathe from beating me. Like, you know, he's like, oh, man, I have to take a timeout. I'm tired. Like, that was the only time that he, I ever saw a timeout. <laughs> but God sometimes puts us in timeout so that we can figure out some things. Because we cry out to God so often, but when you're a good parent, you know when your kids are crying for real and when they're faking. You know the fake cry. <laughs> That, that's the fake cry. And every good father and mother knows that when your kid cries a certain way, something's wrong. i got to rush to him. God's a good father. He understands when we're whining and crying out to him, and it's just for us to get what we want. And he also knows when we're crying in pain, and he has to come and rescue us swiftly. But so often, we just keep looking back to Egypt. The people here in this audience, they said, no, we'll get our help from Egypt. They will give us swift horses for riding into battle. But the only swiftness God says you're going to see is the swiftness of your enemies chasing you. We end up getting into a standoff just like we do with our earthly parents. So the Lord must wait for you to come to him. What do we do when we put our kids in time out? We wait. They'll stop crying. They'll calm down. And hopefully when they come out the room, they'll say, I'm sorry. And what does a good parent want to do? Respond with love and compassion. For the Lord is a faithful God. Blessed are those who wait for his help. Isaiah is speaking to people of his time, words that are relevant to us when he says, O people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. I mean, insert your own words here. O people of Larchmont who live in Westchester. You will weep no more. He will be gracious if you ask for help. He will surely respond to your cries. In other words, God is listening to us cry. He's just waiting to hear, are we serious or are we just whining because we want more idols? And when we cry out in our pain, He's a good father. You might be saying, well, what's all this Egypt stuff? I'm never going to Cairo. I'm not talking about a real Egypt. I'm talking about the culture of the world. I'm talking about the culture of affirmation that we get from the things that we accumulate or the people that make us feel most like ourselves, that God is saying, I want to be that source for you. And when you cry out to me and you wait actively, when you wait with engagement, when you wait with expectancy, I will bless you beyond your concerns. And so the second thing that we need to do is to ask God for help because God responds when we wait and when we ask He welcomes us into his presence. It's like a parent 
he tells us when we come out of that timeout, your own ears will hear God. And right behind you, you'll hear a voice that says, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. In other words, God wants to direct our footsteps, just like a good parent wants to lead us the right way. And God is trying to let us know. He's trying to set, set us up to see that Jesus was sent so that we could be saved from our sins. Our biggest idol in the 21st century is the idol of immediacy. We want everything right now. Maybe it's the idol of instant that is bothering us the most. That we think everything needs to be delivered so quickly. It's one of our idols. But when we come to our Father with expectancy and realize that Jesus is here for us to redeem us from our sins, we'll destroy all your silver idols and your precious gold images. We'll throw them out like these people did, like they were filthy rags, saying to them, good riddance. Because God is waiting for us to trust him. And God is waiting for us to realize that faulty idols and functional saviors can never give us what we need. Listen to me today in this room. Christmas is amazing because God has not sent the judgment that we deserve. He sent us Jesus who we don't deserve. Christmas is amazing because God has not sent judgment or he hasn't sent the justice we deserve. He sent us Jesus. And that's a powerful, powerful thing for our souls today. I believe that God wants something from us. And he's going to wait. And that's for us to recognize that we've been trying to live our own way. And that we need to turn toward his son. So the question for all of us in this room today is, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Now, I know that we land in different places spiritually here in this audience. There's some people that would say that you're a Christian. Some people that are saying you're checking out your faith again. You're unsure. And so when I use words like Satan and I talk about demons and devils, you're like, I don't know if I believe in all that stuff. But I want to affirm you today and let you know that there is a lot of demonic activity in White Plains, in Westchester County. There are a lot of demons literally walking around. I see them every single day. If you haven't seen them, they're wearing a White Plains parking jacket. That's <laughs> demonic activity everywhere. You. <laughs> If you work for the White Plains Parking Authority, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll pray for you, though. <laughs> Those guys give out more tickets to frustrate your spirituality than you can believe. I was going to New York City recently, and I had to catch a train at North White Plains train station, and the parking station was full, so I couldn't park there, and they have street parking. And I've gotten so many tickets because I haven't had enough quarters or cash that my wife made me download the White Plains parking app. And that has been great because I've paid for enough uh, parking tickets in my life that I, I just can't do it anymore. And so I pulled out my phone and I was late. I had to get to the city to have an appointment and the train was about to come. And I was like, all right, let me pull out the app. And when I pulled it out and I pressed it, the first thing I saw was this on the screen, authenticating. And I'm like, bro, I don't have any time for you to authenticate right now. I don't know what that's about, but no authenticating right now. And I'm pressing the screen on my phone, and the next thing that comes up is this, loading. <laughs> what are you loading right now? I can't see what you're loading, and I'm frustrated because I got to catch a train to get to Grand Central. And I keep pressing it, and the next thing that comes up is this. Refreshing session details. By this time, I'm about to resign the church because I'm not real spiritual. God is needing to do things in my heart. You know what I'm saying? And so I just do the mad dash to catch my train. And I get on the train and I put in the, the, the parking number. And then I got this page, which was the active session. I'm parked in White Plains and I'm like, sweet, man, finally. But I was in one of those spots where it's only for like eight hours. So I had to set appointments on my phone to keep paying for the app at the right time, right? So that I wouldn't get a ticket. So I come back home from my meeting and I walk toward my car and there's not one ticket on the car, three tickets. <laughs> the devil believes in the Trinity today, apparently. 
three tickets are $25 a piece. And I'm like, oh my goodness, how could this have happened to me? I did everything I could. I set appointments. I was parked in the right spot. I tried to pay for it. And I still got these violations. You know what sin is? It's missing the mark. It's not always about being bad and doing bad stuff. It's about taking your own effort all the time and trying to put it in the right spot. Because you know what happened? In my haste, in my rush, I kept putting in the wrong number for the wrong parking spot. I paid for somebody here at church today. Like, you got free parking, came back. It was me. Sin is doing your best effort, doing everything that you can, but just missing the mark. And as a result, you end up getting violations. Not because God wants that, but because that's what it brings about. And so I called up the White Plains parking situation. <laughs> I said, hello, Satan. Um, <laughs> Lucifer. No, it was a, I, I called him up and I said, well, look, I, I, gotta, I need a court date because I want to go and I want to fight this because I've got evidence. I've paid up. I paid for the wrong spot, but at least I paid. And in January, I'm going to court. Judge Judy or Judge Brown hopefully won't be there. I don't know what type of judge I'm going to get, guys. But I can tell you that I'm going to appeal for mercy. I'm not going to go in there and say, hey, Satan gave me these tickets and you need to do something about it. I'm going to say, hey, Your Honor, I, I, I parked in the spot that I thought was right. And I tried. But I messed up made a mistake would you just have some mercy on me I don't know who I'm going to get but I know in life that when we mess up and park in the wrong spot or we're too hasty to pay attention to the details of what we're trying to direct our things to that God is not an unjust judge you don't have to feel afraid of what he's going to do in fact the Christmas story is this this is how God loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. In other words, when we come to this baby in a manger, he's not coming to judge you. He's not coming to condemn you. He's the God that wants to save you. So for those of us that are worried and Concern. Christmas is not about what's under our tree. Christmas is about what God gave us that is going to end up being crucified on a tree. It's the gift that God has given us. And there's no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. If we don't believe in him, we perish. But if we do believe in him, we have promise. Maybe the weight that's in your life right now is God authenticating you. Maybe the weight that you're experiencing in your life right now is God loading you with all the character and all the stamina and everything you need. Maybe God is, is refreshing the options in your life while you wait. I use a Mac computer. And for many of us, God looks like the sign that we hate if you use a Mac computer. Have you ever seen this symbol? Oh. You press control, all delete. You press control, all delete, just trying to get the computer to respond. Because when you see this symbol, it means that you're going to have to wait because something's going on. Many of you look to God just like this. All he is is a big waiting symbol in heaven. 
and you're frustrated and you're doing everything that you can. Control, alt, delete, force quit, doing all these things and you're still not getting what you want. Can I tell you today that God is long suffering towards you? Peter says something like this. Peter was a follower of Jesus and he wrote to some Christians and he told them that the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. He wants everybody to turn away from living their own direct. God is not waiting because he hates us. He's waiting because he's patient for our sake. I had my iPhone the other day and I was looking at it and this is the home page and out of nowhere, all of my apps waiting, waiting, loading, waiting, waiting, waiting. I wonder if our lives often look like that screen. Maybe each app is a category in your life. You're waiting for your marriage to get better. You're waiting for the communication in your marriage to get better in one box. Maybe you're waiting for your career to take off. Perhaps you're waiting for somebody to apologize that hurt you. And every time you see them, you're just waiting for them to just and finally admit that they did you wrong. Maybe you're waiting for some direction in your life and God will not tell you where to go. Maybe you're waiting for an answer from God on why this happened to you. Why did it happen at this time? And why did it have to happen so frequently? And God is looking back at you and saying, I'm just waiting for you to see me as the compassionate God that has given you my son. So there's two things that we need to do today. We need to repent, to turn from our own way of living, and turn back to God. And we need to ask Him for His help. If you're here today, and you're a follower of Jesus, and you know that this year has been a great year for you, but there's some areas in your life that you just want to say, you know, God, hey, I'm sorry, I went my own way a couple of times and didn't end up where I wanted to be. I think everybody in this room today raise my hand and say, God, thank you for getting me back on the right path. I'm sorry when I get off that path. Is anybody else going to raise their hand with me that say, hey, I want to ask God for help so that in the new year, I don't have to keep resorting to Egypt. I don't have to keep going in the opposite direction. I'm not going to keep getting affirmation for what people think about me or what they say about me or how they react to me. I want affirmation from my father and I want affirmation from the son of God who was given for me. Thank you so much. If you're waiting for anything particular in this room and you want to ask God for help, would you keep your hand up right now too? You're waiting for a response. You're waiting for something to get better. You're waiting for an answer. You're waiting for hope. Thank you. Look at how many people are raising their hands. Let me pray for you right now. Father, for every person in this room, I feel your Holy Spirit drawing us to look at Jesus again. We're peering into that manger and we're seeing the Christ child and we're saying thank you that you gave him for us to take our sins from us. And today we're asking you to direct our lives. We're asking you to lead us in a path of righteousness for your name's sake. We have no other help besides you. We can try, we can attempt, we can resort to other things, but God, they are faulty gods. Help us to get rid of our functional saviors and trust you completely, knowing that you're a God that's full of compassion and wants to lead and direct us. We thank you for that today and for every person that's waiting for an answer, that's waiting to feel whole again, that's waiting to feel like themselves again, that's waiting. They had a hard year. They've been trying to figure some things out. Some people have moved to different stages of life. Some people are moving into different careers in this room. Some people are taking risks, God. All of these things that were waiting to see in your hand, would you show up and show off your grace and your mercy in their lives today? In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe there's somebody here, you haven't been to church in a while, you've been away from God's presence and his people, you don't have a relationship with God, but you want to start one today, you want a fresh start. For those of you that fill in that category, let me say a prayer with you right now, and I want you to whisper this prayer perhaps, make it audible in your heart, in Jesus' name. Here we go, Father, I've sinned. But thank you for sending Jesus for me to take my sins from me. And today I surrender my heart. I surrender heart, soul, 
and mine to you. Bless us right now. Bless me right now as I receive your salvation. In Jesus' name. Thank you for listening. We'd love for you to join us live at one of our gatherings. We also have life groups that meet all across Westchester so that you can make new friends and grow spiritually. For more information or prayer, please contact us at info at Until next time, live for real.